Hello students, this is week number four of our textiles course. Today's lesson will be on fabric structure, how the, how the fabric is actually made. Um, either It can be either woven or it can be knit, and we'll talk about some of the specifics of that today based upon the knowledge that you have from the previous uh, classes. We're building up to fabric structure. Uh, so you're going to need to have your swatch book and a magnifying, class, uh, magnifying glass close by for today's class. So grab those right now if you haven't already done so. And I will say our prayer because if you say it, I won't be able to hear you. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this day, grateful for the opportunity to um, uh, be affiliated with Ensign College and learn many things about the interior design world. Bless us this day as we study fabric structure, that our minds will be open and that me as a teacher will be able to uh, pass on the things that I have taught in ways that the students will understand them. Again, we thank thee for all of our blessings and say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So as I mentioned, uh, there's a, you know, there's an actual logical uh, pres um order in which I present these lectures. Of course, first our first class we talked about aesthetics, uh, the various characteristics of fabric and sustainability and design. We moved on to fibers, both natural and manufactured. So we learned the differences between those and hopefully you feel like you have a good basic understanding of that. And then last week we talked about how yarns are made out of the fibers, how they're um, twisted into these um, yarns that are given ply and different structures that um, can be used in making fabric. And today we'll talk about how those yarns are actually made into the fabric. Um, structure is the way that cloth is made and is the most common way to identify material. The term refers to the way the yarns or fibers are, are held together. So we'll talk about the different types of weaves, the different ways they can be knitted together and that's how the fabric is identified by the way that it is put together. So our objective today, of course, is to explore different tapestries. Um, many of you seem to really enjoy the tapestries that you looked at in the videos uh, in today's assignment. So we'll start by talking about tapestries and then we will move on to weaves and fabric types. So let's first review the videos that you watched. I um, enjoyed reading your comments. Um, on the videos. The first one was um, kind of a DIY, do-it-yourself weaving. It's thought to have been, we, you learned that, it, that weaving has been around since about 7,000 BC, E, before current era, and became widespread by about 1400 uh, BCE. The video taught about the warp, those long vertical strands on the loom, and the weft, which are the ones that go across, um, <clears throat> those vertical yarns. We learned that the word knit comes from knot from the 11th century, where the steps are cast on, knit, and bind off, the same as uh, when you're knitting by hand. So weaving and knitting are two types of um, ways of making fabric. You watched another video about industrial looms that are very, a very old concept, but the speed of them is relatively new. The video mentioned the loud sound of them in um, Lowell, Massachusetts, near Boston. And I visited one of the factories in Lowell, Massachusetts yeah, uh, sometime in the last decade, maybe six, seven years ago. And out of the 30 or so looms that were in the room, they only had three or four of them working, uh, running at the time. But the sound from those three or four looms was absolutely deafening. So I can only, I got a, a bit of a feel for what it would have been like to be in the loom and have your ears absolutely damaged from the, the loud sound of those looms. The shuttles now travel across the loom a thousand times a minute, these automatic shuttles today, whereas the manual shuttles of uh, days past were substantially slower, as you learned in the video. The Jacquard attachment, which was invented in 1801 by Joseph J.M. Jacquard, um, used punch cards to control the many threads, but that is now done electronically, and we're going to talk at length about those punch cards in this lesson. The final video was on the art of making a tapestry filmed in the factory in Goblins, Paris. The early tapestries um, in this same factory were made for the court of King Louis XIV. 
So uh, the artists uh, made sketches and the weavers interpreted the drawings and the same factory is in operation today. So the process, as you learn in the videos, first the pattern is drawn on clear plastic as a guide, then a color palette is chosen and the yarns are dyed. Uh, the yarns were primarily wool for strength, but then they added silk for luminosity and gold or silver metal to show off wealth, certainly. And chemical dyes have now replaced those earlier um, uh, natural dyes that they used. There are horizontal looms for fabric and vertical looms for tapestry. So horizontal looms are the ones that just lay flat like this that the factories use today to make fabrics. But even today, uh, beautiful rugs and tapestries are made on vertical looms that actually stand up. So, that, so they are standing up in front of you. So the weaver faces the back of the tapestry and the front is going to be reflected in a mirror. This is how it's done today. And many dozens of needles hang from the tapestry with different colors of threads and those needles are picked up when that thread color is needed. I've been in a rug, I've been in rug factories both in Egypt and Uzbekistan and have seen these vertical um, looms in process and it's a real similar um, process as to how uh, tapestries were made. I have been fortunate enough to view some of the world's greatest tapestries. If you go online and Google world, world's greatest, greatest tapestries, about five um, collections will come up. And I could tell from reading your responses that you um, enjoyed learning about a few of them on the video. So now we're gonna review some of the most beautiful tapestries in the world. This is the Goblins uh, factory in Paris, France that was mentioned in the video. Uh, it was started, as I mentioned, in the mid-19th century, um, Louis XIV, and is still in operation almost 200 years later. And this factory has supplied tapestries for royalty since Louis XIV. So it goes way back uh, uh, almost 200 years. It's named, the Goblin name comes from a family of dyers back in the um, mid-19th century. The nearby river, interestingly enough, was so full of urine that it was an effective fixative or mordant for the dyes. Isn't that interesting? A mordant is needed to open up the fibers um, so that the dye is better absorbed into it. And the, the amount of urine in that nearby river um, was an effective fixative, fixative that made the dye um, stick better to the fibers, which I think is an odd thing. The tapestry frames, as you can imagine, were huge because these tapestries had to cover huge walls in, in castles. So they were just massive um, sized uh, frames that these tapestries were and still are made on. And no electric lighting was used or is used today because artificial light subtly alters the weaver's perception of color. So they want to just have natural light when they are choosing colors and, and uh, weaving tapestries. Uh, back in the day, uh, in the early days of tapestry making in France, 160 natural dyes were used. Now there are 30,000 shades available of chemical dyes, certainly. Um, the wool is exposed to light to mellow the colors, um, to kind of make them a little bit more muted. And interestingly enough, listen to this fact. A weaver a master weaver sitting at one of these looms can produce an average of one square meter per year. So if it's a picture one square yard, what that looks like, it's, you know, one square yard, three feet by three feet, that's a little bit smaller than a square meter. And that's how much a weaver can make in one year. So it's a very long, tedious process to make these incredible tapestries that are so complicated and beautiful and have lasted uh, many years. One Louis XIV reproduction tapestry took three weavers five years to complete. So if one weaver had worked on that, it would have taken him about 15 years to make just a reproduction of one tapestry. So all of the Goblin tapestries are now produced for government buildings in Paris, except for one recent exception. Um, some images of Chagall, Chagall the artist Marc Chagall, some images of his paintings were made for Israel's parliament building, which I will show you in the next slide. But other than that, the Goblin factories are now um, produced only for government buildings in Paris. So this is one of the Chagall tapestries in the Knesset in Jerusalem, Israel. 
<coughs> excuse me, the collection of these Chagall tapestries that were made by the Goblins factory include three tapestries. In addition to that, there are 12 floor mosaics that were made to duplicate Chagall paintings and one large wall mosaic. And I have been fortunate enough to see those tapestries in the Knesset in Israel. The tapestries, uh, these tapestries used 160 shades of wool and were unveiled in 1969 in Israel. So worth seeing if you're ever in Israel, be sure to go to the Parliament building, the Knesset, and see these amazing, amazing tapestries of Chagall's paintings. So moving on to another very, very fine collection of, tapestry, of tapestries are in New York. This is one of the world's finest collections and it happens to be the closest one to us. The others are all in faraway places. So if you ever get a chance to go see them, this collection is called Capturing the Uniform. The Unicorn, excuse me, it's in the Cloisters, which is a portion of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And as I recall, um, it's the Cloisters, they're, they're not on the same campus as the Met, they're further north, I think, on the island of Manhattan. I have not seen them, but I've talked about them so many times with um, friends and family and students, I feel like I have seen them. So I'm not sure exactly where the Cloisters are lo located, but it seems like, like my son said, it's further up um, the island of Manhattan than the Metropolitan Museum of Art is. So the image that I'm sure that you're seeing on your screen right now is a portion of one of the seven tapestries. This one's called Hunt of the Unicorn. So let me share with you an account of what it was like when these had to be cleaned a few years ago. It's an absolutely fascinating story. The Metropolitan Museum of Art had deci decided that these tapestries had hung for many, many years. I don't know how many and that it was time for them to be cleaned. So they took down the seven tapestries and they laid them all out on the floor for cleaning. And then a, a, a photographer from the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art was um, in charge of photographing all of these tapestries. Um, so they took, they took about a week photographing the tapestries in sections and this involved having um, two people laying on plastic sheets on the tapestries with a digital camera mounted high above them. The camera's uh, narrow view photographed three by three foot sections at a time. So they moved the cameras around all seven tapestries, photographing sections just th of three by three. And then they attempted to rejoin all those images of the tapestries together so they would have good pictures of the whole tapestries. But they were un unsuccessful. They couldn't match up the images. And after some time, they realized that the tapestries came alive after being taken down and laying flat on the floor. The warp threads were gradually resting, relaxed after being um, after carrying all the weight of being um, hung up, and it actually changed the shape and the size of the tapestries. Um, hanging them changed the shape and size, and then laying them flat on the ground and being cleaned and being a little bit wet they were moving around and readjusting their shapes and sizes back to their original shapes and size. So this article described that they actually came alive. And they eventually had to hire two genius brothers from somewhere in Russia that were great mathematicians. And they figured out how to find a way to join these um, images, even though the tapestries were alive and adjusting themselves. So it took them three months of computations to figure out how to do this. And I have no concept of how they were able to do it, but they were ultimately able to produce flawless images of the seven uh, ancient tapestries. I think that's a, just a great story about um, uh, what happens when they were taken down and, be, and to be cleaned. They actually relaxed from the weight of being hung up vertically and uh, took on a, a slightly different shape. Another great collection of tapestries, and I have seen these. These are in the V&A, the Victoria and Albert, Albert Museum in London, England, called the Devonshire Hunting Tapestries. This is a collection of four 15th century tapestries of hunting scenes on display in London. And I've seen them in the past, and I'm going to go see them again in uh, May of this year. Really looking forward to that, and I'll get some um, new images to include with my slides then. They're absolutely wonderful. Four 15th century tapestries in England. 
and um, let's see what is next. We seem to see unicorns a lot in these ancient tapestries. I've seen this collection as well in the Musée National du Moyen-Âge in Paris, France. These are six Flemish tapestries depicting the five senses plus a sixth one that depicts love and adoration. They're woven from wool and silk. Again, another one of the, the greatest collections of tapestries in the world. Look them up sometime and spend some of my images that you're seeing here are not great, but they're worth looking at online. The final uh, one that I'm going to show you is called the Bio Tapestry. It's in the Musée de la Tap Tapisserie in Normandy, France. And it's actually not a tapestry, it's really an embroidery, but it's probably the most uh, famous uh, embroidery or tapestry, as it's called, in the entire world. It's one of the earliest pieces of government propaganda commissioned by William the Conqueror's half-brother to tell the story of William the Conqueror's accomplishment. It's 230 feet long, imagine that, by 20 inches using a linear storytelling technique. It's a thousand years old. We have no idea how long it took to make it or how many embroiderers uh, worked on this project or how many colors of wool or um, we just don't know a lot about it. But the final section of the tapestry is missing, unfortunately. But items that are included on the tapestry include things such as Halley's Comet, um, as well as uh, the stories of William the Conqueror's um, conquests. So as I mentioned, it's te technically an embroidery, but it's called the Bio Tapestry. I've not yet seen it, as I mentioned, and when I looked at it online recently, I found out that it's going to be loaned to a museum in London for an extended exhibition soon. So if you were thinking about going to Normandy, France this weekend, double check and make sure it's still there um, because it is on its way to London sometime soon. And I don't know the specific details of that. But some of the greatest tapestries in the world we have just um, viewed rather quickly. And we'll talk a little bit more about the details of tapestries now and what um, goes into making them and um, how they have changed over the years. <clears throat> the early Renaissance tapestries, 1300 to 1500, primarily were uh, made in France and Belgium, were the main centers of tapestry production. Limited colors were used, only 20 to 30 different colors of wool with very strong contrast, and there was little or, or no use of linear perspective. So if you look at this image, who I think is, I think that was supposed to be King Arthur, and there's just no depth to it. His face, his body, his clothing all seem flat. It's as though his body is just one dimensional, almost part of the chair. There's no linear, there was no linear perspective at the time. But this is the most notable of the tapestry period, 1300 to 1500, and the tapestries from that era are certainly the most valuable. They're the oldest, and it's the uh, the beginning of the tapestry uh, period. The appeal of tapestries was that they were portable. If you lived in a castle and were moving to a palace across the valley, you could take your tapestries with you. They, you would just have your servants take them off the wall and load them up in wagons and haul them across the valley. They were considered very good insulators for cold castles. Imagine those you know, large rooms and castles and you might have a, a fireplace on one wall to heat the room and those tapestries on those cold um, stone walls would insulate the room and help keep it a little bit warmer. So they're considered to be good insulators. And as we saw in the bio tapestry, they were an excellent means to communicate, communicate propaganda uh, when they were controlled by the government. The story that the government wanted to be told was told through tapestries. So that's the early Renaissance tapestry period, the most important tapestry period, 1300 to 1500. The tapestry transition period uh, came next, uh, 1500 to 1600. And now painters, instead of weavers, became the designers of fabrics or of tapestries. So painters um, who were more skilled at creating images would design them instead of the, the weavers themselves. And now Belgium, Flanders, Belgium, that's where we get the um, term Flemish tapestries, became the most important tapestry weaving center. So most of the important tapestries were now made in Belgium as opposed to France. 
And this image shows a very vengeful God banishing Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden in this image of a, a Flemish tapestry. So in the next couple of centuries, the center of uh, tapestry production moved back to France. Uh, more tapestries were produced in France during these two centuries than in Belgium. France reigned supreme as the European tapestry due to royal patronage. And we talked about that, um, uh, the, the Louis XIV starting the Gobelin uh, tapestry production during this time period. And the Goblins factory just made tapestries for the royal court. And now, as I mentioned before, they're only producing tapestries for government buildings with uh, very few exceptions. And then I've listed here two other commercial <clears throat> uh, tapestry factories that came out of this same period. So now we have a real shift um, with um, the painters of the previous century were designing the images that were being woven into the tapestries and we see a now shift we, now we see a shift we see linear perspective in these tapestries as you look at this uh, group of people in this tapestry you see that the people's the images in the front of the tapestry on either side are larger than the ones in the back and that's how linear perspective is used so that your eye is drawn into it and there's depth perception now in the tapestries that didn't occur in the ones of the earlier centuries so that's a big difference when France became the center of tapestries. We now have linear pers uh, perspective as well as thousands of colors used. So there's very, very subtle shading. It's more of a painterly look um, uh, compared to the previous tapestries that, that um, there was a strong contrast between the dark and the light because they weren't using so many um, different colors. So they were now able to get very, very subtle shading on their tapestries. I mean, they're just beautiful. I hope you all get opportunities to see them. So the popularity of tapestries have started to decline in the 19th century. <clears throat> tapestries were replaced by Chinese wallpaper for a time. Uh, people lived in smaller and better heated rooms. So tapestry lost its appeal as an insulator. So there weren't any new trends during the 19th century <clears throat> in tapestries. Um, and during that time, most tapestries were reproductions of paintings or previous tapestries. So there wasn't a lot of original work coming out of the tapestry factories at that time. And uh, there weren't any new trends being developed uh, as tapestries certainly be were less popular in the 19th century. In the 20th century, we saw a revival of tapestries uh, led by William Morris of England. And again, in, uh, that was the 19th century, and then again in the 20th century by a gentleman from France in the 1950s. So that's going to end our tapestry discussion. And we'll move on to fabric structure and how fabrics can be woven or knitted. So the image on the left shows a woven fabric uh, made out of wool, and the one on the right shows a knitted fabric. And you learned a little bit about these procedures in the videos that you watched uh, prior to this class. Um, generally speaking, um, most fabrics are woven, and generally speaking, less expensive ones are generally knitted. That certainly doesn't hold true. Um, do I have some samples here? I thought I had some samples. Yes, I do. So if you look at this um, woven sample first, this is a beautiful wool. Um, if I look at it very closely, it's a herringbone, but you're not going to be able to see that detail. It's woven, which makes it very, very stable. And we'll look at some in our swatch books in a minute. You can see if I pull it horizontally and vertically, it just doesn't give at all. If I pull it diagonally, I get just a slight amount of give, but it's a very, it makes a very, very stable fabric when it's woven. And this is a knit fabric that I'm showing you now, and it has a lot of give either way. Horizontally, a lot of give vertically, even more give um, diagonally. So it's certainly less stable. We're going to make t-shirts out of this. Um, more of our less expensive fabrics in general are knitted. Things that we wear that we want to be very, very comfortable with. Clothes that we're just going to hang out and relax in. Those are generally going to be knitted with less structure in them than the woven fabrics. <clears throat> you saw on one of the videos a little bit about looms. So just 
to review, I want you to understand the basic parts of a loom. So you have the warp threads that you see on this image. They're the ones that run horizontally in this picture. They're the ones that are attached to the loom first. The warp threads have to be in place. You have to wind all of those onto the loom before you begin. And then the weft, <clears throat> the weft um, threads are woven across the loom which is shown in this picture by the filling shuttle. Those would become the weft fibers or the filling uh, weft threads or yarns or the filling yarns that go across the loom once it already has the warp yarns in place. So that's the warp or weft. Uh, the woven pattern depends on uh, if the warp or the fill is over the yarn and, and how, it, how, the, how it is woven creates uh, the actual structure and the pattern. You need to understand the term selvages. They're the vertical edges of the uh, woven fabric, and they are bound where the filling yarns wrap around the edges as they are woven. So when the shuttle comes to the end of a row, has to turn the corner and go over a warp thread and come back, those two edges on either side of the fabric create what are called selvages. And it's a term that I'm sure some of you are very familiar with, and I'm guessing some of you have never heard before. But in the fabric world, the textile world, it's a term that you need to know. So this is an image of a very, very wide piece of fabric. It's actually a sunbrella print that I used to make pillows in the backyard of one of our homes. And you can clearly see the selvages on the right side and the left side. My image is reversed, so my right looks like my left and my left looks like my right. But you can clearly see the selvages <clears throat> on either side of the fabric. They're the vertical edges of the woven fabric where the weft yarns wrap around the warp yarns as they are woven. So can you see that? Here is a small sample of a piece of fabric and this um, selvage edge, it's often a different color. On this one, it's actually white. And sometimes on these, um, there's there are things printed on the selvage edge. This one has a little color swatch that shows you the three colors that are in this fabric. It also is going to show you <clears throat> the manufacturer of this one. This particular one was made by a company called Wool and, and Needle Flannels, and it's called Primetime Gatherings. So sometimes you'll get some information like that on the selvage itself, where they've printed information on there that's sometimes very helpful. But selvage is a term that you need to understand. Those are the edges of the fabric. They don't fray. If I'm looking at the selvage edge here, it's very, very stable. If I'm looking at the other edge, I can pull threads off. Um, it, can, it can be unraveled, whereas the selvage edge generally cannot be unraveled. So good, cons, uh, good terms that you should understand uh, about fabric. So an, another little image that I made um, to show you how, the, uh, how a loom is actually set up and this I made out of the leftover uh, cut pieces of paper that I use to make my sample weaving cards that you will be doing this week. You will be making six weaving cards this week um, out of beautiful colored fabrics or colored um, papers. They make them so much prettier if you use a colored paper. It's prettier that way than if you just use white type paper. And it's hard for me to see the... Um, the pattern if you're just using the white paper. Um, anyway, as I mentioned, you can see the warp threads. Those are the ones that in this image run, run um, uh, from top to bottom. All those warp threads are put on the loom first. And then your weft, your weft excuse me, or filling threads are the ones that come across um, horizontally in this image. So hopefully you're starting to understand um, those terms a little bit and understand how those are woven to make the beautiful fabrics that we have come to love and didn't really know how they were made. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk now about some of the different types of weaves and you're going to be creating these weaves in your weaving cards. And I, I hopefully you won't find it to be too difficult. The most difficult part will be, you know, if you're not really, don't have great manual dexterity, you might have trouble weaving them together. Feel free to get help from somebody on those if you're having a hard time weaving over and under. For some people, it's easier than others. It can be a little bit of uh, a little bit time consuming. I found it fun. I found it therapeutic to actually weave the paper together. So good luck doing that this week. 
uh, your first uh, card is going to be a plain, uh, one of the basic weaves, just a plain weave, which is shown on the left side of this uh, slide. A plain weave is where every individual warp thread laces alternately with every individual fill thread. So it's just over and under. If you uh, wove those little um, <clears throat> on those little looms as a child, uh, many of us made little pot holders for our mothers. <clears throat> that was generally just a basic weave. Unless you got fancy <clears throat> and tried other things. So basic weave, it's shown really well in this image in blue and yellow. You can see that one warp thread goes over and under every weft thread. Very, very simple, plain basic weave. So that should be the first um, weaving card that you make, starting out with the most basic one. <clears throat> On the right, you will see a basket weave. Several yarns in each direction are grouped together and woven as one. So on this one, it's a two by two weave. You can see two threads um, on the weft, uh, two filling threads, weft threads going over and under two threads of the warp threads. So just two by two. A basket weave would also include a one by two or a four by four. Anytime you have a, a basic weave where some of the fabrics are, or some of the fibers are grouped together in larger numbers than one, that creates a basket weave. And it's shown on this chair in a very, very obvious way where some sort of a natural reed is used, um, putting maybe maybe 12 um, yarns of sort together over 12 yarns, making a very obvious basket weave. So this is what your plain weave <clears throat> uh, card is going to look like. So we're gonna pull out our swatch books now and look at some basic plain weaves that are in our swatch book and see how those look. So let's uh, go to one through four in your swatch book for starters. And those should all be basic weaves or plain weaves, plain weave, plain weave and plain weave, balance, balanced, balance and balance. So those are all gonna be just a basic plain weave, that, which is the first one that we discussed on the previous slide. So if you look at that, um, use magnification if you need to, starting with number one, that beautiful cotton. Kind of a nubby cotton it almost looks like a, a linen with those nubs in it it's really quite beautiful and if you start by pulling one thread off the right side and then one thread off the bottom and then another thread you know go ahead and just pull the threads right out pull one off the right pull one off the bottom pull one off the right you can see that it's a balanced weave just you know just a plain weave with one over one all the way through it. So that's a very, very balanced plain weave, one of our basic weaves. If you look at swatch number two, it's even more obvious because the yarns are bigger. So go ahead and pull one yarn off the right, like this. Pull one yarn off the bottom, like this. And if I keep doing this for too many more classes, I'm not gonna have a piece of fabric left. Um, but if you do that, one off the right, one off the bottom, you'll see again, that's a balanced plain weave, which you've already written down um, on your cards. So balanced plain weave, one by one. Turn the page over to number three, which is the hop sacking. And same thing, if you don't want to pull that one apart, look at it under magnification, and you can clearly see that that is a balanced plain weave. But you know what? I'm gonna take that back because the sample they gave me is actually a basket weave. On mine, it is two fibers, uh, one weft thread going over and under two warp fibers. So I'm gonna make a note in mine. Mine is actually a basket weave. So I'm not sure what yours is. If it's one thread or one yarn over one yarn, it's a it's plain, if it's more than one yarns, it's going to be a basket weave. So looking now at number four, which is done in three different colors, but you can still see that that is a plain weave and you can test it by pulling one thread off the right, one thread off the bottom, and you'll see that that's a plain balanced weave. So um, number three seems to be the odd one on mine that is actually a basket weave and I'm not sure 
if you have the same sample as I do. Some of the fabrics that are sent out by the company vary from time to time. And since my book is older than yours, you might not have um, the same ones that I have. Okay, that is a basic weave plain. Move on to a basket weave, and we'll look at some samples of a basket weave. It's a variation of the plain weave in which two or more warp yarns pass over and under two or more filling yarns. Uh, the most common interlacings are two by two and four by four. I'm sorry that yarns is spelled incorrectly there. Um, so we have a couple of samples to look at that are basket weaves. Turn to number 10 in your book. which is uh, called a duck, a cotton duck. And if you look at that under magnification, first of all, the yarns are very, very small, very, very hard to see. And you should see two warp threads passing over one weft thread. Can you see that? Your eyes are probably better than mine. But under magnification, I can clearly see uh, two going over one. So that is considered a basket weave. So what I have on the screen right now <clears throat> is a little bit incorrect. It should say two by one is also a basket weave instead of just starting at two by two. So anytime you have two or more going one way or, or over one or more going the other way. Let's also look at number 49 in your book. That's a toile de jouie. We'll talk a lot about these toiles in next week's class. I love them and we, we will spend some time discussing them. This is also a basket weave. And look at it closely. You should see two uh, let's see, one weft thread going over and under two warp threads. So a two by one basket weave again. But when you make your card, you're going to make it in a basic two by two basket weave. So it's very, very clear to you what it's supposed to be. So that's a basket weave. And uh, all of the cards that you're going to be making are considered basic weaves. And then beyond that, there are weaves that are uh, much more complicated. But you'll be making six cards covering six of the most basic weaves. So another basic weave is a twill weave. The fill yarns, which are the ones that go across vertically, or excuse me, horizontally, pass over one or more and under two or more warp yarns, but they're offset um, when they do the second row and the third row, they're offset by one thread each time that creates the appearance of diagonal lines. And you can see that if you look closely at the image on the bottom left, you can see those diagonal lines are created in that twill pattern. And the most obvious twill are on your jeans. If you're wearing jeans right now, look down and I'm, I'm actually wearing some wool slacks and they're they're also a twill and I can see those diagonal lines and if you run your fingernails across the, your jeans or any twill diagonally you can actually hear you know you can actually hear those little your fingernails going over those little diagonal lines that, that are created in the twill so you'll be making a twill um, as one of your weaving cards Another basic weave is herringbone, and that is formed by bands of twill lines with alternating direction. So it's like a twill where you're creating diagonal lines, and then you're going to turn usually a 90 degree angle and create twill lines going the other way, and then do it again and again, creating what, what's called a herringbone. And I think you'll have fun doing that um, on, your, um, on your weaving cards. Let's look at... Slide number 11 in your books. And that is a twill, as is written in my notes here. And as you see, it creates diagonal lines. Listen to this. Can you hear that? I'm running my fingernails over the diagonal, and you can actually hear those diagonal lines created with a twill. And then back to our discussion on herringbones. On a herringbone design. Okay, this, this shows you what your weaving card is going to look like for the twill. We already talked about that. Um, we've, let's, look at, let's look at a few more examples of twill before we move on so you can really see what that looks like. 11 was a twill that we looked at. Number 12 is actually a twill as well. 
but it's hard to see because it is woven with two beautiful uh, colors. On mine, it's woven with a yellow and a green, but still, if I run my finger over that diagonally, I can feel those ridges created by that offset pattern, which will make more sense to you when you start making yours. If you look right now at number 13, you're also gonna see that that's a twill, but it's specifically a herringbone because the twill diagonal lines run in one direction and then they dramatically turn the other direction. It's in a, uh, uh, they make a corner that's actually tighter than a 90 degree corner, making that a beautiful herringbone design, which is very popular. Also look at number 80 before we leave this slide. Put number 80 in your swatch book. Clear back almost to the end. And that shows a ticking, which is a fabric um, that is also a twill. And that's what most uh, mattress covers used to be made of back in the day. Actually, even when I was a child, long before you were born, I had mattress covers that were made out of twill um, ticking. Uh, and uh, like I said, this will make more sense to you when you make that card. This is what the herringbone card is going to look like. You have that twill line going one way. You turn a direction, you turn another direction, you keep turning directions, and that creates that marvelous herringbone pattern, which I think will be fun for you to make. Uh, we saw a herringbone, didn't we, in number 13 in our swatch kits already. Now, the word herringbone actually comes from the herring fish, or it could be called trout bone, because any of the, the bones in fishes, as we look at this image, you can actually see the, the pattern that we're talking about, the lines go one way, then they turn a corner and go the other way. And if we lined up several of these herrings together, their bones, and we would see what creates this herringbone pattern. And that's why this um, weaving, this basic weave is called herringbone. It's named after the herring fish. We also use this herringbone pattern often in hardwood floors, it, uh, but the, the word herringbone literally comes from the fish herring, interestingly enough. Um, two more basic weaves that you're going to make are the satin weave and the sateen weave. And they're very, very similar. It's not important for you to understand the differences between the two. I get them confused all the time. One is the exact opposite of the other. If you look at this image and then turn it on its side 90, de 90 degrees, uh, the next image, you would have pretty much the same thing. Or if you turn over a satin weave, on the back side, you're going to see a sat sateen weave. They're just the opposite of each other. So you will see that as you make your weaving cards. Um, let's see, do we have samples of satin and sateen that we should look at here? Let me see where those are. No, we don't have any samples listed there. Here we go. Here's the basic weave for satin. Uh, turn to number 51 in your swatch book to see an example of a satin. Number 51. Both satins and, and sateens make a smooth, unbroken surface. And so if you run your finger over number 51, this satin, you can see that it's very, very smooth. You're not seeing any, feeling any ridges or texture to it. Um, so that's what a satin looks like or feels like, number 51. And it's hard to see the weave on that because it's so tightly woven, but you'll get a feel for the satin weave when you make your weaving card. Okay. Uh, sateen is similar to the satin, satin, but the opposite effect is uh, produced. And number 53, if you'll just look at the next one in your book, actually 52 and 53 are both satins or sateens. 54 is another satin, but it has kind of a, a nubby feel to it. Uh, because of the yarns that were used, but you can see how all of those create just a very, very smooth um, weave. We're going to look at some other popular weaves in a, a few minutes, but right now I want you to look around your room and see what weaves you can find. Are you seeing anything that's woven? I'm showing a textile up here, a little dishcloth that was woven for me by a friend. She's a very famous weaver in Salt Lake. Her name is Lejean Carruth. And she made this beautiful little towel for me. And you can see a combination of a more comp uh, complicated weave combined with a basic weave. The smaller stripes are just a basic uh, one by one 
a, a base, the most basic weave uh, that we talked about in our earlier slides. So if you look around your room, what are you seeing? What, what is woven that you're seeing? I mentioned that I'm wearing pants that are a twill weave. I'm also wearing a sweater that is a knit, a turtleneck under it that's also probably a knit. We'll talk more about the, the knitted weaves in just a minute. You might have an afghan or a throw or a blanket where you could, that you can look at right now and see some different weaves. So just be aware of what's around you and see if you can pick out something that has been woven on a loom which is different than being something than a tapestry sort of a design or something that is being made by um, uh, the knitting procedure that we are going to learn in a few minutes. But right now, let's look at a few more complicated weaves in our swatch books, okay? So stay with your swatch books for a few more minutes. <clears throat> We're gonna start with a damask or a damask. It's pronounced both ways. It's a tone on tone or positive negative patterns created by using satin in certain areas and sateen in other areas. As I mentioned, those two are just opposite. So if you look at a, a damask or a damask and then turn it over, as you see in those top two images, you're gonna see just kind of a reverse. They're generally done just in two colors uh, it, with a satin weave and a sateen weave. Turning it over, you're gonna see the exact opposite on the back side. Um, we have a damask in slide number 17. Please turn to that. And um, we have two colors, as I mentioned. And if you turn over and look at the back side of it, it's going to be completely reversed. Mine's kind of a red and gold combination. And then the red and gold are in opposite places when I turn it over. So that's one of the characteristics of a damask or a damask. Now looking at a crepe weave that you see on the slide is a variation of a twill or satin where ends are, um, I don't like this description here. The uh, characteristic that's important to know about a crepe is that it has a stretch kind of built into it, which makes it ideal for upholstering uh, furniture. For example, when you have to wrap fabric around a corner if it stretches a bit, it's going to go around that corner much more easily than if it doesn't stretch. So look at number 23 in your books to see a crepe. Mine's a beautiful green. If I pull it horizontally, or if I pull that vertically, it doesn't give at all. But if I pull that diagonally from corner to corner, you can see that it has stretch. Now this is why I wanted you to make sure that you mounted your fabrics so that the bottom was free so you could lift them up and play with them. So it's ideal for upholstery because it has that diagonal stretch built into it. Okay, that's a beautiful crepe. Made out of a polyester. Wow, that's a beautiful sample. Uh, we have Dobby and Jacquard weaves, uh, which are not actual um, types of uh, fabric structure, they are a means of fabric manufacturing that allow different degrees of patterning with a variety of fabrics. So it doesn't really describe the, um, the weaving type, it describes more the pattern. So really this slide should probably have been in our next class where we talk about, well, we will talk about these in, uh, in next week, but we're talking about more complicated weaves. And this Dobby is any small scale geometric pattern it's not a, tomb, a term that I've used a lot or heard a lot in the textile world, a dobby, but we can contrast that with a jacquard, which is a large scale pattern. It can be geometric, floral, or abstract. Um, actually, I think I, uh, in future classes, I'm gonna move this slide and, and discuss this in the next week's lecture when we talk more about um, patterns that, are, that create the look of the fabric. But terms that you should know, jacquard, jacquard weave and a dobby weave. We have a sample of a Dobby in number 15 in your book. So turn to number 15. Again, it's a very, very small geometric weave. And the one in your swatch book should be entitled Dobby Squares. A very, very small geometric pattern is what a Dobby refers to. Um, they were created and named after a Dobby mechanism that was attached to the loom and instructed the loom to the and instructed the loom to weave these tall, uh, these tiny patterns. 
Most dobbies today are made on a Jacquard loom, but they're still called dobbies because of their small pattern. So just keep that in mind. Dobby is a small pattern as opposed to a Jacquard, which is some of a kind of a larger pattern. Okay, we've looked at number 15. Um, let's look at, talk a little bit more about Jacquard fabrics. This shows a Jacquard loom and how complicated it is. It has a large number of the warp threads that are um, individually controlled by a loom pattern control mechanism called the Jacquard head. And this allows for the largest possible variation in woven fabrics. So let's mention just a few things about Joseph Jacquard, and then you're going to be doing some research on um, Joseph Jacquard in just a few minutes. But just as an introduction, he invented the Jacquard mechanism in uh, this should say the early 19th century. I just hate it when I borrow slides and there are incorrect notes on them because I can't change them. I should, I should fix this though. It's the early 19th century. He created it in 1801. It used a punch card system to replace a job that had been done by hand. And uh, the jacquard weaving allows for a great variety of pattern and that's, like, that's still the case today. Setting up a jacquard uh, loom is very labor intensive. You can see how many uh, warp threads it took to set up this loom, so they're not changed out often. And if you wanted to order a custom made um, jacquard fabric, it would be very, very expensive because um, they would have to switch out all of these warp threads and program it to um, meet the specifics of your custom job. So running a yarn with texture in a difficult jacquard web is extremely difficult. So jacquard uh, fabrics are ne nearly always feature a smooth warp. So just a little bit about that jacquard loom and the jacquard weaves. So at the beginning of our lecture, we talked about these beautiful handmade tapestries, but we also have uh, what are called today tapestry fabrics that are mimicking those beautiful fabrics of uh, those beautiful tapestries that we studied earlier that most of us will not have the privilege of owning in our lifetimes. If you look at number 22, hopefully it'll be immediately obvious to you in your swatch number 22 that that uh, tapestry fabric was designed to imitate an early tapestry. Of course, it's not gonna be anywhere near as intricate and um, valuable as the hand woven tapestry, but they're woven on jacquard looms and um, usually with six different colors. You might want to take time and count the colors in that. And tapestries often feature period style florals and scenes reminiscent of true tapestries, but a commercially produced tapestry can be used for any pattern from small geometrics to large art deco. So you see some small ones in the image on your um, screen right now. You see some large more Art Deco with vertical lines and uh, small print ones and some that the bottom right one, I guess, is more is probably the one that most that imitate, imitates the original tapestries more so than the others. But we have fabric that's actually uh, woven to look like tapestries. So a few more of uh, these more complicated weaves and then we'll move on to our knitted fabrics. Uh, we'll look at just a few more of these. A brocade we can see in number 21. Brocade's quite interesting. We have continuous brocade and cutwork brocade. So you have these threads that float across the back of the fabric. So if you look at the frogs in the top image, uh, you see the lighter colored threads come to the top of the fabric to create those frog images. But on the back side of the fabric, those weft or filling threads just float across the back of the fabric and then are pulled to the front when the image needs to be created. So that's kind of a continuous brocade with these um, floating weft threads. And we contrast that with a cutwork brocade where those extra yarns are actually clipped away from the back so that they don't um, carry on the same way that they would in a continuous brocade. So a couple samples of those, or maybe just one. Let's look at number 21. You should already be on that page. That's a brocade. And we want to look at the back and see if that's actually a continuous um, brocade or a cutwork brocade. Okay, and I'm not seeing any of the, it's hard to see the floating threads actually on this. They're very, cover small sections. 
But if you look at it closely, you can see that those are continuous. They're not cut, so that would be a continuous brocade. Um, it's done on a jacquard, we, a jacquard loom and creates, um, it's different than the damask that we looked at because you're using more colors on that. And uh, the brocade just talks about that, those weft yarns, whether or not they're continuous or they're cut on the back side. Um, it's not real obvious on this one. I wish we had one that, that showed you the difference a little bit better, but we'll move on. So why is this information useful? If this has been a little bit tedious the last half hour looking at all these different types of weaves. So you might be asking yourself, why do I need to know this information at this point? Um, so you're probably not alone if you're asking that question. Let me get my notes caught up to where we are here. So when a client brings you some fabric that he or she has chosen, you're going to be able to call that fabric by the right name. You're going to say, oh, what a beautiful damask, or that's a lovely brocade, or I've never seen such an incredible tapestry weave. Or when you bring fabrics to show your client, you're going to be able to say, oh, I, I think this Dobby weave might be a good choice for your chair, or look at the curves on your chair. Maybe a crepe fabric would be the best choice for that. So you're going to need to know the difference between a jacquard, a Dobby, and a damask, and if you don't, you can know the difference just by checking your swatch book. I have several swatch books and I refer to them often. They're very, very helpful in identifying um, different fabric weaves, complicated fabric weaves, simple fabric weaves. So we're gonna look at just a few more, I promise, uh, but you need to be familiar with these. Turn to a velvet, uh, swatch number 29. Velvets, you're probably familiar with a velvet, but you probably don't know how it's made, do you? So the looms have cut wires that cut the loops. Um, they're woven with little loops on them and then the machine comes back and cuts those loops, creating this short pile that feels so good to the touch. That's 29. You can look at number 30, which is another uh, voided velvet, another velvet which is voided, meaning some of the areas, um, traditionally those areas were burned away with acid, but today they are woven that way. So that's a voided velvet. Turn the page over to 31, you're going to see a crushed velvet, and that is done with steam and wrinkling and, and different ways of um, creating that, that crushed velvet look, which I just love. 32 is a velour, which is um, similar to a velvet, but this has a little bit of a deeper pile than some of the velvets that we looked at earlier. Um, velour has a longer, plusher pile, as it says on our screen. Uh, a couple more pile fabrics that give us that, um, that texture and that depth to them. Look at terry cloth, which you're probably familiar with on number 78. And terry cloth is generally made out of cotton. We want terry cloth to be absorbent. If you ever find terry cloth that's made out of polyester or something else, don't buy it. You want terry cloth that's only made out of cotton. You want your bathrobes to be made out of terry cloth. Your bath uh, rugs, your towels, all those things should be made out of terry cloth because they're so absorbent. So it's produced by making those loops on the fabric, weaving those loops in, but they're not cut. Those loops remain in place on the fabric, giving us um, a very, very absorbent fabric if it's made out of cotton. So it differs from velvet and velour, which are also created with those loops by um, loosening the tension on some of the threads. But on the velvets and the velours, that loop is cut, whereas on the terry cloth, it is not cut. And you can actually see that loop quite obviously. Uh, don't worry about frise on this page. A couple more can, uh, pile fabrics we wanna pay attention to. Corduroy, look at number 27 in your book. Corduroy you're probably familiar with. It's used in clothing that can also be used as an upholstery fabric, 27. Um, it's woven so that it has those, those vertical ridges on it. So those are weft pile fabrics, usually cotton. And um, velveteen is similar. We're going to look at a velveteen number 28 right next to it. Okay, Velveteen has an all over short crop pile cut from the weft floats. So on both of those, the actual threads start out as loops, but they're cut just like the velvet, giving us that nice um, feel. 
We don't have any chenille, sample, chenille samples to look at, unfortunately. Our questions here. Uh, we are on number six. What geographic feature made Lowell, Massachusetts? Um, made Lowell, Massachusetts uh, significant in a, a hundred years of textile history beginning in the 1820s. And I think that, that was an easy, easy to find that answer. There needed to be a river close by. There needed to be a water source that they could convert into steam to run the engines. By 1824, the area around Lowell, Massachusetts was crisscrossed by a canal system that served numerous cotton mills and textile mills along the Merrimack River. So hopefully you found that. Who was Lowell, Massachusetts named after? Francis Cabot Lowell, who was a pioneer textile industrialist. You might have read a little bit about him. Who were the mill girls and what were their typical ages? Number eight, young female workers who came to work in industrial corporations in Lowell, Massachusetts during the Industrial Revolution, and they were typically ages 15 through 35. Depending on what source that you read, some um, say that some of the girls started at age 10, but that was not uh, common. And what was the Lowell system? This was really quite remarkable. In Lowell system saw raw cotton coming into the mill at, or into the factory at one end and out of the other end came the finished cloth. So all of the steps to making fabric were included in one factory, which made it very, very efficient. And that was called the Lowell system. And why did it fall? Why did Lowell fall into decline 100 years later by the 1920s? The factories were getting old. They were no longer competitive. The technological advances after 1895 meant less employees were needed. Some mills were moved to the south to be closer to the cotton sources. So the depression actually came a little bit early to Lowell, Massachusetts. And you might have read more about the mill girls who went to work there in the 1800s. And that was a great thing. Girls uh, prior to that time, those girls' mothers had never been able to work outside of the home and earn their own incomes. And in the early days of the mills, you might have read that the mill girl, girls were treated very, very well. They were given housing, they were given food, they were given for op, um, opportunities for education. But um, as I'll show you in a slide in a minute, those great opportunities for mill workers did not last. So this is the book, uh, Jacquard's Loom, How a Hand Loom Led to the Birth of the Information Age. Remember, we're talking about the Industrial um, Revolution and these textile mills were right at the heart of the Industrial Revolution. So let me read you this quote about life in the mills after the happy reign of the mill girls. It declined tremendously. As I, uh, I think I mentioned to you earlier about the, the noise. It was the noisiest room you could ever be in. There's machines going and shuttles going back and forth. And sometimes they'd fly off and they were pointed things. And if they ever hit you, boy, you'd know it. The whole place vibrates. When I come out of there at night, I was shaking. I was still in the mill. Then they put me in the finishing room. They were doubling up all the machines. So it made that much more work. There we got $13 a week. No matter who you are or where you were in the mill, you got $13 a week. A week. You didn't really need names because everyone got $13 a week. Wouldn't do you any good to complain. They were so petrified for their jobs in them days. It was just painful. So that's a quote from a mill worker talking about the incredibly loud sounds. You can visit what is called Lowell National Historic Park in Lowell, Massachusetts. I attended there. Um, I went there some years ago and that's where I heard the mills operating or the looms operating, uh, which just blown away by the loud sound of those looms. Okay, as we mentioned before, fabrics can be woven or knitted. You saw this screen earlier on, and we've talked a lot about the woven fabrics. And now we're going to spend just a little bit of time on the knitted fabrics, um, like sweaters and t-shirts. And I showed you the samples before, but again, this is a woven fabric that's very, very stable. And a knitted fabric, if you're wearing a t-shirt right now, you can see that it stretches very easily. It's loosely woven. If I hold it up to the light, I can see light through it. It's generally not going to last as well as a stable woven fabric. It's interesting. As a quilt maker, people are always asking me, how do you make a t-shirt quilt? 
And I've made a lot of t-shirts quilt, but you have to stabilize that t-shirt fabric because the knit, um, the knit uh, process that goes into making that t-shirt leaves it very, very unstable. And it's just going to stretch, you know, all over the place when you try to make it into a quilt. So it has to be stabilized with some sort of an iron-on material on the back of it, and then it's ready to be made into a t-shirt quilt. Now you know, that's a big secret. So knit uh, fabrics, you can see how those knit fabrics are, are put together so that they hold together. If you've ever knitted by hand with a knitting needle, you, you, have, to, you have one fabric going over and then the other one going inside of it, creating this knit process. Uh, one set of yarns loop around themselves or other yarns to form an interlocking plane. And the hard part, uh, the tricky part about it is, is if one of these knit, uh, one of these threads get cut, you're going to create a run. Um, if you've ever worn nylon stockings, they run easily. Once one little thread gets uh, broken, you're going to get what's called a run and the, all of those threads are just going to pull apart because that's the knitting process. It, um, it is easy to damage something that is very, that is knit. Let's look quickly at number set, uh, 67 in your swatch book for a warp knit, 67. You don't even need to look at that under magnification to see that that is knit. If you lift up that white fabric, you can see those little loops and you can imagine that if one of those loops were cut, the tension of it would just pull it out and you'd have just this big nasty run kind of right in the middle of <clears throat> your knit fabric. There are other categories um, other than woven or knit. We have fabrics that are embroidered. We have lace. Sometimes lace can um, be kind of a knit um, configuration. We also have non-wovens. So we're going to look at just a few of those so that you have a basic understanding of um, embroidered fabrics. There should be one, number 67. That's that same one that we looked at. That's really not a good example of, of an embroidery even though my book says that it is. The image on the screen <clears throat> shows a better example of embroidered, an embroidered design. I know I've been talking too much when I've run out of water, but we're almost done. We have a quilted fabric in our book, number 84. Look at that real quickly. We use quilted fabrics um, often to make bedding. The one on the right would be just suitable for a mattress pad. Uh, the, quilted, the quilting basically holds together three layers, a back, uh, a, a fiber fill in the center, and a top. The quilting holds those three layers together. So that uh, a quilted fabric doesn't really fit into our woven or our um, knit categories. It's kind of in a category by itself. Uh, in addition to kind of the low-end products that we see in our book, 83 and 84, you can see this beautiful chair that has incorporated probably a silk that has been quilted on the back of the chair. So quilted fabric certainly can be used in upholstery and, uh, with a beautiful effect. Uh, some examples of laces and shears. You can look at number 77 in your book for a lino weave, which is a, a very, very loose weave that could be used possibly for curtains. We see shears on the screen. You have some shears um, in uh, your books, number 41 and 42, if you'll turn to those. Shears are what draperies are made out of. That's a particular weave where the light shows through these shears. We have casements in um, number 67, which I believe we've already looked at. That weave is called a casement weave. And then we also have a, a lace, but don't have a good example of a lace in our books other than that 67. But you can see how that looks in the slide on the screen. Our last category of fabrics that are not uh, woven or knit would be the non-wovens because they're not woven. That's pretty obvious. Uh, we have felt, which is the most obvious uh, one that we use the most often. It's typically made from wool. We don't have a sample of that. That's just where fibers are all pressed together um, with steam and some sort of a, a, adhesive material, but they're not woven or knit. We also have vinyl on the bottom, which is a type of plastic 
that is kind of bonded together with heat. It can be embossed um, to add character or texture. We have bark cloth uh, on top, which is made from trees. Color can be added by hand or by mechanization. Um, cork on the top that can be used on walls as a wall covering most often. And we have a vinyl um, that we don't have a picture of, but we do have a sample of a vinyl in, in our books, number 75. And I believe that's the last one finally that we're going to look at. So turn to number 75. Um, they're non-fibrous synthetic materials formed into a thin layer of fabric. They're waterproof. They're certainly easy to clean, uh, but unbreathable and plastic in appearance. So you wouldn't want to wear something out of that, but you could certainly use it for a wall covering. So if you look at number 75, you can see that it's a vinyl covering. It's not woven. It's just made kind of like paper and then print. It's not really printed, but they've added little fibers onto it to, uh, embossed with different um, little fibers that give it a texture and give it a really nice appearance as a wall covering, but that's the non-woven category. All right, we are about done here. So let's review what we have learned. We've covered a lot of material today. Um, loved discussing with you all of the tapestries, looking at some of the greatest tapestries of the world. Then we moved on to woven fabrics, how those are made on a loom. We talked about knitted fabrics, which are made on a different kind of a loom. And then we finished the discussion by talking about some of the non-woven um, fabrics and materials. So that covers a lot of material today. So let's do a quick review of what we have learned. We talked about this at the beginning of the class and I'll keep reviewing this because it's important to understand this whole pro procedure. We start with natural um, or man-made fibers. Those are gathered and then they are spun into yarn or made into filament. And then those filaments are laboriously combined or twisted into yarn with just the right combination of ply and twist. Then they are meticulously woven or knit into yards and yards of gorgeous fabric. And here's just a, that silk that is showing on our screen is one of my favorites. It's a botanical. It's um, fabric that I use to make bridesmaid dresses for my daughter's wedding. I should put a picture of those bridesmaid dresses in here. Maybe I'll do that eventually. Um, but it's hard to believe that this little cocoon from the silkworm, Bombux Mori, can be made into the most beautiful fabrics after going through all of the processes that we talked about above. An interesting procedure. So next week you have your weaving assignment. The advice that I would give to you is um, the instructions tell you how to make it out of uh, just plain old computer paper or typing paper as it used to be called. It's much easier to work with a cardstock which is a little bit heavier and it's easier to see the weave if you use two different colors. That would be my recommendation. Also get help if you need help weaving these cards and use a cardstock in two colors if you possibly can. And you need to watch uh, four videos, they're short videos on um, fabric design as that will be our lecture next week. So until then, have a great week. Good luck with your weaving cards. Don't leave them to the last minute. They're going to take you several hours to do. They're worth a, a lot of points. Um, I think 150 points. So it's very important that you get those completed and get those completed on time and upload images of those prior to class next week. Good luck with those. Have a good week and I will see you next week.